Welcome to this Dementia Life sponsored by Dementia Action Alliance. Our website is danow.org. Uh, I'm your host, Chuck McClatchy, and I live my dementia life with Alzheimer's disease. On, Deme on this Dementia Life, we talk with incredible people living with dementia and awesome people that care about us and, and help us in every way they can. My guests today are Paula and Nancy, who are the co-founders of Horse Connected, and I'll kind of let them, you know, explain what it is. Nancy, why don't you be first and go ahead and introduce yourself and, and what kind of what got you down the road of, of helping people with dementia? Thank you, Chuck, for having us today. Um, our organization is called Connected Horse, and um, I am a gerontologist by training, so I've worked in the field of, of aging and senior living for over 30 years. And my colleague Paula and I have been friends and, and worked on a lot of committees together. And, and we felt that, you know, we needed to do something new to help people that are being diagnosed with dementia and then what happens to them. They still want to live their best life as you do on this show. And we, we just thought we wanted to take what we loved, working with older adults, and then combine it with our other love, which is we are horse people, we're equestrians. And so from that, we decided to get started and I went to Stanford University and asked if we could do a research study with them. And we wanted the data behind this idea to really back up the support and the evidence towards how horses are so wonderful to be working with all these other populations they've helped. Children with disabilities and at-risk teenagers and, and prisoners and um, everyone, all these different people, veterans with PTSD. So we thought, why can't it help people that are newly diagnosed with dementia and their care partners. So the funny story behind that is I wanted to help the person with dementia. Well, we wanted to help both. And Paula's like, no, we can't leave out the family member, the care partner. And so in all research, they seem to divide them. And we thought, well, we want to buck the system a little bit and look at both of them together because, of course, they're on this journey together. So Paula, would you tell your side of that? <laughs> Sure. Well, our, our two sides are kind of coming together, but um, I'm Paula Hertel and co-founded this with Nancy. And um, we have all sorts of stories because we were so passionate about wanting to really change how people um, view dementia and to move away from this fear and this hiding to how do we really stay connected. So not only the person who's received the dementia diagnosis, but, but us as a community and us as family, how do we begin to talk about this diagnosis and be with people as people, not as their diagnosis? Mm -hmm. And so we were so passionate about it and we just wouldn't take no for an answer. And so we mm -hmm. went to, to what we call in marketing, the assumptive close, right? We just, we went to researchers and we went to barns and we just, with our enthusiasm and our, and our grit said, we really wanna do this. And, and people began to understand. We did have a few people say, oh, the, those are the women doing that crazy horse project. <laughs> and we, we wore that with a badge of honor for a yes. while. <laughs> um, but I think what really drove it for us is that we were, we were building this program with horses, with our participants, and we were moving away from this model of doing things to people or trying to fix people or fix family systems to helping all of us, um, our facilitators, our horses, our, our volunteers to, to be with people and to start to learn from the horses what it means to be in the moment, to be mindful and to respect and be with people unconditionally. And so that's really what's the, the sort of wonderful outcomes that have come from this, this uh, program is that our facilitators and volunteers are like, I get so much out of this program that, um, and then the, the horses that we're working with and the barns are like, our horses get so much out of it. And so when people are giving and receiving care, not always having things done to them, but we're with each other, that's where we see the real magic happen. That's that's just awesome because I know you know it does you know help veterans, but I, I think you guys just hit a gem because you know, thinking back about horses, you know, if you walk up behind a horse or something, it's not gonna go good. 
you know, <laughs> and the same way with somebody with dementia, you walk up behind us and yell at us or, or anything like this, it's not going to go good because you startle us. You know, you, you come where we can see you and you come towards us and, you know, your mannerisms are, are okay. There's not going to be an issue. And I think for people to see, especially people with dementia around horses, you know, and the love that they have and the connection they seem to have too with some, you know, a, a, an animal that big that can be that gentle. And uh, how is it, you talked about you do a lot with the families. How have the families, how do they seem when you want to do it with them and their, their loved one apart? Let, you know, are, are they kind of apprehensive sometimes? No, just the opposite, Chuck. They want to do something. Once you get the diagnosis, it's like any diagnosis. It's devastating to your spouse, to your siblings, to your family members, adult children, friends, everyone. But they still want to be apart and, and be together and have experiences together. So we do have, uh, you know, they don't have to be a blood relative, but it is someone who is in their life and caring for them on an ongoing basis as partnership. And so we don't see any hesitation. You know, they say, oh, you mean I get to come too? And when they first come, they think, oh, you're gonna just do everything with my husband. But no, they are part of the group and, and we work together. And Paula says so beautifully is that, you know, those roles, those labels just fall away and, and they become a, a pair of whatever their, their relationship is. Again, just having a joyful day. And the horse is the teacher because we, we chose horses, not dogs or cats, you know, or anything because because horses are prey animals. And for thousands of years, you know, they're scanning their environment, making sure, you know, are you okay? Are you gonna eat me? Are you gonna bite me? <laughs> Whatever. I mean, they really are the most present animals, I think in the whole in the whole universe they're always just thinking in the moment and they're true truly um, with you and they're sizing you up and they read your energy and so a horse as many horse people know that might be listening today in nevada is they're like a mirror to you they're a, a reflection of you so whatever energy you're putting off they're they're pushing it back or they won't get near you or they'll be curious so these we hear that a lot from participants that these beautiful giant creatures that have been part of our civilization since we began now have um, you know, another important role to play in teaching us how to just be present and to be um, part of, of their experience. And we particularly, not always, but we particularly have a lot of older horses, so we love that. It's older horses have a purpose, they're not put out to pasture, nor are human beings. That, that brings up another question. When you, do you go through a process when you select the horses that you're going to use for this? And kind of what is it? Paula, do you want to take that one? Sure. Um, it actually, it's a very good, a, a good question because of course, their horses, just like people, right? There's all sorts of personalities and things like that. So um, as part of Connected Horses, protocols, we have an evaluation that we worked with a veterinarian and other horse equestrians with to evaluate is, does a horse want to do this work? Does a horse have the right temperament to do this work? Is it going to be safe, right? Because if we do our work around the horses that we choose to be in this program are safe and wanting to do this kind of work, then, the, then everything is much more uh, relaxed. And then the day of the program, we also work with the horses are like, are you into this this day? And we've had horses that are like, for whatever reason, we can create our own stories or like, I don't really, not really in the mood to do this, or they'll, you know, turn their backs on us. And we honor that. And we, and we talk with our participants about that. And it, it is because sometimes you could get into this work where you get tied into your own outcome, like, okay, we're doing a grooming exercise. Oh, I really want this person to be able to pick up the horse's hoof and clean it. But there's as much learning and understanding and reflection that happens when something doesn't go your way. And so if we have a horse that's just not into it and we recognize it and we say to the participants, hey, it feels like George isn't really into it today. Let's let's give him a break. 
and let's go get another horse. It's not a failure on the horse. It's not a failure on the participants. Like it, the discussion is, wow, you had awareness and you were okay with it to let that horse do what it needed to do to take care of itself. And for, for a lot of people, there's that's that sort of aha. It's like, okay, am I, when I'm in relationship with a person, am I pushing them to get something done out of my own outcome versus what's best for me or what's best for the person? And so those kinds of um, things that happen in interactions that happen with us with the horse tend to come up when we really need to hear it. That is that is a that is a quote you, you need to put on your website, and it's that you know it's in the moment, and that's so hard for people to understand sometimes, because especially as as our dementia journey continues, we are more and more in the exact moment, and it may not be the moment that you're in, mm -hmm. you know, and you need to come to where we're at, because we don't have the ability to come to where you're at. And it's just like you said with the horse, if they're having a bad day, you know, it's going to be catastrophic if you demand that horse still do it when they don't want to, when they're going to fight back, you know, and resist. Right. And that exactly what happens to us. Go That's ahead. why we built the curricula, Chuck, that, you know, it's not just a pet therapy type of experience. We have two to three consecutive weeks that people are learning with the horse as their teacher. And when we took the idea to Stanford and they a crazy we called it affectionately our crazy horse project, they're like, wait, there's some magic. In fact, our researcher was terrified of horses. So that's how we started out and she got to get through it. Then we moved to UC Davis in California, which um, Davis is the number one veterinarian school in the country. And they saw the validity of the work with the horses as well, because they have a herd of horses that um, they take care of there that um, many of their, vet their veterinarian students work on. So we are really uh, lucky to have UC Davis help us with the horse criteria and put all that together Why we built the cr criteria around the workshop. So we wanna make sure that's really clear that the families understand that this is a commitment for a couple of weeks, like we're doing a workshop in Minden, Nevada coming up here in October. And it is a commitment of consecutive weeks. And we've had sometimes two daughters come or Paula just had a situation where a granddaughter came. It's a whole family system and, and Paula as a social worker really sees, you know, how important that is where we heal the family as well as focus on the individual with the diagnosis. But no more labeling. The horse could care less who's who. They just want to know if you're in relationship with them. And that's that's great because I've always, when I talk to people, I always tell them that Dementia is a family disease. It's going to affect every single person in that family, from the youngest to the oldest. It doesn't matter. So what is, I know you guys have some stories. What are, what are some of the reactions you've had about the, the program that you have from the people that, that participate? Well, they, they show up kind of, you know, what are we going to do today? And then they slowly connect in and just say, sit around and say, gosh, it's so beautiful here. We're out here in the barn, it's so quiet. And they get in your senses as Paula's saying. And then they really, you can almost see their shoulders drop. They just start to relax both sides. You know, the, the daughter that's, you know, telling her mother, correcting her all the time. And then the mother who's just, you know, in the moment starts speaking. It, it's just, it's, we have so many stories we could be on all day. But I do want to show, say that um, we, we will share some, but the research, we, we wanted to do the research and we compared it from Stanford as well as UC Davis. So we had that evidence behind it. And the research did show as we did pre and post test over a 15 hour intervention, um, which was three consecutive weeks basically. Um, and they would have time together and, and we would have a you know, time to debrief and kind of get to know each other, always kind of a social time to get some coffee and a pastry or apple or whatever you want. And um, it's really important because you see the group bond really, really quickly. And that's that's important. It's the first week, they're just a little bit nervous, you know, what are we doing here? And then you really see them kind of settle in and enjoy the experience with their loved one. And uh, the research did show for the care partner, not the person uh, living with dementia because it was over a, a, the 15 hours, 
it was very close, unfortunately, but not um, to a p-value of 0 0.001, which shows in research, uh, that the individuals did have less anxiety, depression, and better sleep, and, and feeling um, part of a group, the social support part, is so important. So we affectionately call it a support group on steroids because you're actually doing something. You're not just sitting around talking and complaining or worrying. You're actually doing something together. And we felt that that was one of the most important things in this program that we activate individuals and they start being in relationship again and uh, the roles disappear. So one of the cool things that we do is that, you know, we have them together, they come together, but we slowly start to separate the two and have their own experience and maybe put them with someone else who's living with dementia, not their loved one or another care partner or whatever, and they have these experiences together. And at first the families will be watching every minute and then all of a sudden they're like, okay, you, you can have them. We trust you now. It's really fast how fast that trust comes in. Paula, you might want to add something about that because it's just like, man, I've never seen it so fast as a professional running support groups for over 20 years. I've never seen that type of, of um, you know, people letting go and really being comfortable in that that's being in this environment with the horses. And I, I, I would just add to that. I think the trust comes from this sort of um, unconditional acceptance that that the horses have, that our volunteers have, that um, so our volunteers though there's they have jobs and we're obviously very concerned about safety and we're looking at time and all of that, but they equally participate because it's a it's a group. We're here together, not to judge, not to teach, not to make something happen, but to allow for this opportunity for people to, to be with and learn from the horses. And we, I, I sort of categorize it into three different categories and we've talked about a couple of them, but one is this um, ability to have experiences where you're giving and receiving care. And oftentimes what we hear from care partners is that I'm, I'm giving and the person who has a diagnosis has a sort of dependency model of I am receiving. And, and that's just this role that people get stuck in. And we, we mix that all up and have an opportunity where people are giving and receiving care to these, to these horses and how good it feels just to sort of mix up those roles so you don't get stuck. And then the other one, which Chuck, you talked a little bit about how, how, two seemingly opposite things can both be true. And we hear all of the time, wow, that horse is like it's floating in the air. And then I hear the hoof come down and it is so strong. Or this horse is so gentle and slowly nuzzling me, but look at those muscles. And it's this sort of realization of we can be having this really awful thing happen to us and we can still have beautiful tender moments. Like it isn't all, always one or the other. And then I would say the third thing that we sort of put into a bucket of that happens is this idea of self-awareness of, and this is I think particularly true for the care partners, this how do I self-regulate myself so I don't get into this role of I've got to do for someone and I, I can learn how to be with because that self-awareness, and this is where the mirroring of the horses is really powerful. If I come to a situation where I've got three minutes to get something done and you're coming with me horse because we're supposed to walk down to the end of that 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 um, arena and then I'm gonna pick up and clean your foot and let's go, let's get it done. The horse says, I, I, I don't think so. And you know, maybe with a cat or a dog, you can pick it up and make that animal do it with a horse there's negotiation and there's collaboration and there's there's this given and, give and take. And so we do a lot of breathing and it is really funny. I, I would say at least three or four times in every workshop, you'll have a horse that just does this big belly breath. And I always teasing like, okay, who, who's forgetting to breathe here? You know, it's like, let's take a breath. Let's get relaxed. Let's get connected with each other. And then let's try again. Nancy calls it, you know, opening the heart. So we all have our own sort of phrases that we use, but it really is about being aware 
of what energy you're bringing into the situation, what you're bringing into the into the room. And caregivers have told us a lot that that is really important. And they walk away with this sense of both, all participants walk away with this um, increased sense of self-confidence. Like I can be independent in this world. I have all of these things that I'm trying to negotiate, but um, this was an incredible experience for me. And I learned a lot about myself and I learned a lot about my relationship. Can one of you talk about, you know, a little bit, how many, how many, uh, places that you have this and how many places that you would like to, you know, develop in, into these? Well, currently we have only one in Nevada. Um, one of our early adopters is a barn in Minden called Kids and Horses, and it's a therapeutic riding stable where they do help children with disabilities and um, other, other groups, the veterans, etc. So they were an early adopter, and that's right outside of Reno. Uh, we also, the rest of the barns we have are in Northern California at this point. We have interest because we're doing a training. You have to be trained to do this. Not anyone can just do it. Like I said, it's not pet therapy, bring a pony and pet it. It's very much based on a curricula that is evidence-based that helps support the individuals at the end to have that positive outcome. And so we we have barns in Canada and the East Coast and Texas, Colorado, other barns that are wanting to start. Our dream, Chuck, is that anyone that gets a diagnosis will be, you know, maybe the doctor will write someday, you know, go spend time in the, the Connected Horse Program or go spend time with the horse to really help. We, we targeted the early early diagnosed group because that's where we saw we were losing things in the system, you know, as professionals working in this field. We saw that upon diagnosis and people are like, well, now what? What do I do? We have a few barns we've started. You know how every grassroots thing starts small and then starts to expand out. So that's what where we are right now. But we've had a lot of interest where people might be Googled and found out what we're doing. We are going to present at the Dementia Action Alliance Conference in Indianapolis in a few weeks. And then we were also going to present um, at the PATH, Inter that's the International Therapeutic Riding Association Conference in a few weeks. So we expect to get more interest. Not anyone can just do this work. They do need to go through this training and they can't be too outcome driven and they have to love horses. That's number one. Um, <laughs> and working with this population of, of older adults. Um, it's a much, as Paula said, a slower pace. And if you go in there with the outcome, I need to fix exercise one, two, and three, and it's going to ruin the magic that the horse brings to the table. And so we consider it a triad that the horse is really the teacher and we're the facilitators. So at this point, we are still small but mighty, very determined and not going to give up since 2015 when we started, even through the pandemic. We started on some other programs with sensory boxes to bring people to the barn. We have an app we're working on for people in later stage. We want to help the whole continuum because that's what we do professionally and um, feel that it's very important to support these individuals. That's awesome. Well, we're almost out of time and I, I want to ask just one, one kind of closing question. And I kind of ask this to everybody that comes on and uh, Paula, we'll start with you. If this is if this video is the first one somebody has seen and they're just trying to understand they have a diagnosis or their loved one has a diagnosis, what would you tell them? I, I would say this, one of the first questions that we ask everybody when they come to the participant, to the, to the groups is, what do you think about when you think about a horse? And how does that feel in terms of of your experience. And people either have, oh, I can remember as a kid when I fell off or they have an experience of, you know, riding a horse on the beach. But there is always some, really this emotional trigger about an experience they had with a horse. And that's what we really want to convey to people is that this emotional memory, these responses that your bodies hold on to is um, where the magic and where the healing is and horses help us get there. Awesome. So thank you both very, very much for taking the time and good luck. And I really hope it works out for you guys. Thank, thank you, you for really your support. All right. So now like you for joining us today. Um, I'm your host, Chuck McClatchy. And remember, the brain may forget, but the heart remembers. And we'll see you next time. Thank you. Thank you.